Hey, it's Liz and Leanne. It is uh, President's Day weekend. Here we are, uh, 2023. So we are not doing a new show tomorrow. Instead, we thought we would share with you uh, a very fun interview we did in May of 2016. This is Liz and Leanne talking to Phil Knight, who's the CEO of Nike. He had just published his memoir, Shoe Dog. And uh, I worked at Nike for 10 years. Half of that time, I was head of PR. The other half, I was the global chief marketing officer. Yes, I was. Yes, I actually was. <laughs> and Lee and you? <laughs> I worked I worked at Nike for four years full time and then a couple of years freelance afterwards. I started as a lowly production assistant in the film and video department and worked my way up to a writer and producer. But weirdly, um, even though I was sort of low person on the totem pole, I had a shocking amount of interaction with Phil Knight when I was there because we produced the sales meetings and all the stuff that he would do to talk to uh, the global investors and to the athletes so even, even you, though, do, you do tell a funny story here about the time he called you once late on a friday night like dolan what is going on so, just, yeah i was shocked basically <laughs> i was shocked how much interaction i had with the ceo of nike <laughs> and we thought this would be timely because as we mentioned in last week's episode of satellite sisters there's a new movie coming out in april um called air and it's the story the alleged story of um Air Jordan, how Air Jordan came to be. And in this movie, Ben Affleck is playing Phil Knight, which we find hilarious. And Matt Damon is playing Sonny Vaccaro, who worked in the basketball department and recruited basketball players to work for Nike. So he allegedly <laughs> discovered Michael Jordan. We'll just leave it at that. But we thought it would be fun for you to listen to this episode and hear the real Phil Knight. So in case you go see... Ben Affleck as the fake Phil Knight. You'll do, you'll know what you're dealing with. <laughs> and just to note, Liz, um, we say in the interview that Phil wrote his own book, and he did essentially. He did work with the collaborator, uh, J.R. Moringer, who at the time when Phil worked with him was best known as Agassiz, you know, Agassiz collaborator. But now Jr. has gone on to work with Prince Harry, so he mm. was the highly paid uh, co, you know, ghostwriter of Spare. Um, but Phil, this is mainly Phil's work that Jr. he says just helped structure and um, and pull the book together, which I believe actually because he yeah. was always a very good writer and a very super good, good writer. Yeah, very yes. good about telling his own story. And I feel like for Harry, he probably did most of the writing. So this yeah. is not that. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, give a listen. We will be back next week with a new episode of Satellite Sisters. Hi, this is Julie. This is Liz. This is Sheila. This is Monica. This is Leanne. We are the Satellite Sisters. You are listening to Satellite Sisters to go. We are the Satellite Sisters. Welcome to the show and happy Mother's Day uh, to everyone listening. I'm Liz Dolan. I'm in Santa Monica, California, joined by my sister, Leon Dolan, in Pasadena, California. Leon, you're a mother. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you, Liz. Thanks very much. It's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent weekend. <laughs> That's the way I think of it. It is. Good for it's you. It's excellent. It's excellent. <laughs> and we kind of have a special show today. Are you excited? I, you know what? I'm excited and I'm nervous and I'm really looking forward to this interview. So we are talking to uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Phil Knight, the creator of Nike, who has recently published a memoir called Shoe Dog, which is in the in the shoe business, Leon, we know it's a term of endearment, right? Right. It's someone who really lives, breathes, eats, sleeps shoes. Someone who's been in the business for decades and they're selling them, they're making them, they're manufacturing them. They're a shoe dog. Shoe dog. So Phil Knight is a true shoe dog. And both you and I have worked for Phil Knight and have been Nike employees. Yes. Correct? Yes. So. I spent a shorter time there than you. I worked there in the late eighties, early nineties in what was called the film and video department, but we also did sort of special events and big live events and things like that, uh, scripted stuff. And, um, I just, I loved working there. I love, I loved working there. It was fantastic. It was fun. It was hard work. We worked all the time, but it was a fantastic time to be at Nike because if you could do something, they would let you do it. Mm -hmm. didn't really matter what your qualifications are. And I'm going to talk to Phil about that. <laughs> yes. About being wildly unqualified and yet being given a lot of responsibility. Yes. Yeah. 
but you were there for a longer period of time yeah. and uh, worked your way up the corporate ranks. I was there for a decade. I started as the PR director, and we're going to talk a little bit about that when we talk to him, like what that was like in the beginning, because Phil Knight is a painfully shy and famously reclusive person. So if you're the person in charge of like getting him out there (laughs) (laughs) or deciding like, oh my God, don't let him go out there. (laughs) Well, you talk about the man, the myth, the legend. And in his case, it's true mainly because he wanted it to be true. He preferred to sort of have a myth build up around him than actually speak to people. Oh my God. My favorite story about that, Leanne, is I, he told me once he had he had gone to New York on a business trip, and while he was in New York, he went to a Knicks game with Spike Lee. So there's, you know, in the floor seats, of course, and there they are, and a lot of attention is being paid, and people were coming over and taking pictures of them. And uh, But then somebody came over and asked Spike for his autograph, and then turned and asked Phil for his autograph. And Phil just is not a highfalutin person. So he was like, you don't even know who I am, do you? And the guy's like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I know who you are. He's like, really? You know how? Yes, I know who you are. He's like, okay, what name do you think I am going to write on this piece of paper? And and the guy said, "Uh, you're Eric Clapton. (laughs) (laughs) And he could not have been happier to be mistaken for Eric Clapton. Like he would so much rather be mistaken for Eric Clapton than be recognized as Phil Knight. And so I think, you know, you'll, and he reflects that in the way that he talks. Anyway, it will, this is, uh, this is a lot of fun for us because we have a personal insight and we're we're not going to like go through the like Nike chapters in the book. Right. Right. I mean, he's been on a lot of talk shows, and so you've probably seen him talk about the swoosh and the waffle iron and sort of the actual hows, you know, of the company and, and the and the shoe business. So we're not going to talk so much about that, but because we were both there, we're really going to try to focus on what made Nike special, because it is a place of fascination when you're an alum of Nike, which is kind of how it feels, really. It's more like being a college alum than a former employee. People are always asking, what was it like to work there? What was it like to work? there. And so it's something I've thought about that culture. And I think it's what made Nike special because we've both gone off and worked at other places and never really quite found that same, same culture again. Would Mm -hmm. you say it's Mm -hmm. unique? Yeah. And it, it was intrinsic to Nike and, and made it work, made it work. So that's what we're going to try to talk to him about. We'll see. (laughs) Yes. We'll see how it goes. You never know. And he chose to write the book just about the very early years of the company. So it's from the moment he founded it with his partner, his track coach, Bill Bowerman from the university of Oregon to the moment it went public. So there no, there's no celebrity athlete stories here. This is really about the hard work of being an entrepreneur. So I definitely recommend it to people that want to know what does it really take to build a business and build a culture? Because uh, he gets into the nitty and the gritty of what the first dozen years were like. So, and he wrote the book himself. I mean, he did not have a ghostwriter. He didn't work with somebody else. This is actually his writing. And because you and I have both spent seen him at sales meetings and do presentations where he was a, an exceptional presenter to mm-hmm. sort of a closed circle of people, you can tell this is really in his voice. This oh, is totally. how he talks and how he thinks and, and you know, and there are dropped in the middle of paragraphs about, you know, something, there's like just a gem of business philosophy, you know, Mm -hmm. one or two things that you can take away out of every chapter lines that you remember. So it's a fantastic read. And it's very, very personal because he has endured some, some personal tragedies and, you know, there's some difficult subjects in the book. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and, it, and it was surprising to me that he chose to write about some of the things he does write about. So, uh, yeah, it's fascinating. So, um, here we go. Shall we- yeah, lace up your sneakers, Liz. Get your Cortezes <laughs> out. Lace them up. <laughs> All right. This is our interview with Phil Knight, the creator of Nike. Oh, cow, are we really going to do this? <laughs> <laughs> totally. We are doing this. Philip H. Knight, we are doing it. All right. We, ha- we have an official intro, so just indulge us here, okay? 
<laughs> All right. well, I hope it's not too long. No, we do, no we're going to do the no. really long build-up earlier. So <laughs> this is a short one. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. You're listening to Satellite Sisters. I'm Leon Dolan in Pasadena, California. I'm here with my big sister, Liz Dolan, in Santa Monica. And uh, we are really pleased to welcome a guest to the show today. He is a failed encyclopedia salesman. Uh, he is also the creator of Nike and the author of a fantastic new memoir called Shoe Dog. Phil Knight, welcome to Satellite Sisters. Thanks very much to both of you. Are you ready to come back to work yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. You, got, you got anything interesting going on there lately? Well, let's, yeah, how there's is, lots going on. You can still fit in. <laughs> how is that little company of yours doing? I don't know. When I started, this is Liz. When I started there, it was an $800 million company. Now you're what? Thirty billion, I hear, Phil. A little over thirty, yeah. Okay, all right. Right well, on plan. <laughs> <laughs> we now that we've read the book, we know that. Yes, we we know that was your plan. <laughs> Never a doubt, huh? <laughs> it has been fun this week, though. Um, you know, this is pretty much your media tour, so it's the trifecta of Robin Roberts, Stephen Colbert, and the Satellite Sisters. So. Exactly right. Exactly <laughs> so right. We, we appreciate that. But it reminded me of back in the day when I was new to the company, new to working with you. You may or may not remember this, Phil, but the uh, the Today Show was coming to town. And they called and they said, we're doing a whole tour of the West Coast. We're going to do Seattle on Monday and Portland on Tuesday and San Francisco on Wednesday, you know. And when we're in when we're in Portland, we would like to talk to Phil Knight. He's the leading entrepreneur. And uh, and they were going to talk to Ed Gates in Seattle and, I don't know, Larry Ellison in, in San Francisco. And I was like, yeah, I'm sure that will be fine. Hang on. And I, and I go to you and you're like, no way. No way I'm doing that. <laughs> and I think so you I, talked me into it, though. Well, yeah, I called the Today Show back and I said, we're in. He's very excited, very excited <laughs> to talk to Brian. And like yeah. every few days I would say, are you in? And you'd say, I'm totally not doing that. <laughs> and then on the Monday before the Tuesday, I was like, are you in? And you said, yeah, I'm in. I said, what made you change your mind? He said, well, I couldn't be any worse than Gates was this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that helped. And your persistence, of course. You just wrap me around your finger all the time. <laughs> so have you enjoyed being out on this book tour then? I mean, this book is incredibly personal. And I guess you've yeah. reached a point in your life when you want to talk about all these things, which was not where you were when Liz was trying to coax you into the Today Show. Have you enjoyed this last couple of weeks? No. <laughs> okay. Oh, come on. No, you I... Uh... Well, you know, parts of it were okay, but it's a, it's a grind, and uh, that um, I kind of owed it to the publisher to do it, and uh, I did it. And parts of it were fun, but it's uh, uh, I'm sitting here, I'm almost done, and I'm very tired. So yeah, I'm assuming we're your last stop. That once you get to Satellite Sisters, you're done. <laughs> no, that's actually not true. I got two more next week. Oh, one okay. of them, one of them is maybe not quite as you. That's Stanford University, but the other one uh, is Cleveland High School. Oh, oh, that's fantastic! They're in Portland. That's great. That's yeah, great. Yeah. That's so nice that you're doing that. All right. Well, uh, there is, you know, the book is amazing. You people who are listening, you should just go buy the book. We're not going to retell any of the stories in the book. We got, we got plenty of other things to talk to Phil about. One of the you're things. Not that... talk, talk about that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I fished out the. The Nike principles I was given on my first day of work, which would have been August 1st, 1988. And this is a document, though, that was written for employees in 1977. And, you know, there's some references to it in the book. But as I reread this, I was like, this is kind of an amazing way to think about a corporate culture. And I, I think so much of the Nike success story is not so much the business plan, but the culture. Uh, uh, no question, and it—I've uh, said that virtually on every stop, and I don't know that it registers with anybody but you. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me read a few of the highlights of this list. I mean, it's some of it is like just very prescient. Number one, our businesses change. Number two, we're on offense all the time. Like everybody who knows Nike knows. Number three, Leon, this one was your favorite, right? Yeah. It was break the rules, fight the law. <laughs> right. Fight the law. I mean. <laughs> That doesn't well, seem like... Well, don't break the law. Don't <laughs> yeah. break the law. That, 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 we thought that was a step forward. We had to think about that a little bit. <laughs> but the one that really jumped out at me, not having looked at this in a long time, is number eight, you list the dangers. 
And the number one danger is bureaucracy. Of course, that's true in any company. But the number two danger you list, I think, is so unique. You wrote personal ambition. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Like, why did you why do you think personal ambition is? I think most companies would say they want their employees to be ambitious. Well, they want a collective ambition. You got a personal ambition that I've always said that uh, two nines working together will beat two tens working apart. And the personal ambition is a guy who's saying, you know, I want to go to the top and, and run over people to get there. And uh, that's not a health not that's not healthy to the culture, which we already touched on. It's pretty important. Yeah, and the next one under that sort of supports that. It says energy takers versus energy givers. Yeah. And- and I looked at. I, I do think this is very contemporary language about how to create a corporate culture. And it's amazing to me that you were sitting at a typewriter in 1977. And it I, was a typewriter, wasn't it? No, I can see that from the type. Yeah. Yes, I've shown yeah. it to people at work, and they're like, "What font is this?" I'm like, "I think it's that's, not that's a royal font. portable." I think. <laughs> Well, one of the things that comes through in the book and all your stories uh, is that Nike was a really fun place to work, even if it was really hard and we worked a lot of long hours. And when people ask me what it was like to work at Nike, I always say, well, it, for me, it was like business school and film school and summer camp, like all rolled yeah. into one uh, yeah. where I worked. But one of one of my most vivid memories, Phil, is of you. We had some interaction, even though I was very low down on the totem pole. And it was right before the world campus opened in 1990 and we were having a weekend long celebration and there were formal proclamations and guests and all these things going on. And my department was in charge of organizing that. And I was sitting at my desk at like 7 PM Friday night and I got a call from you like directly to my line. And you said, Dolan, we don't know what's going on tomorrow. Come up here and tell us. And I was shaking. I had to walk into the Michael Jordan building for the first time, up those stairs, and there was you and Dick Donahue in your office. He was then the president, and you were asking me about the schedule, and I was showing you everything. I was showing you things I had written for you, and the whole time I just kept thinking, I hope he doesn't know that a year ago I was a cocktail waitress at the Mangy Moose. (laughs) (laughs) But you're cool with that in the book. You talk about beginners. And what potential yeah. beginners bring to a business. Yeah. No, yeah. It's, uh, it, you know, you get the right ones. I mean, it, uh, you get the right, uh, the right people. Uh, the, the background is not so important. You know, people, people ask me all the time when they hear that I used to work at Nike. They say, what's it like to work for Phil Knight? And uh, before I tell you what I say when they ask that, I, I would love to know, what you think the answer to that would be? Because honestly, in Shoe Dog, there's some pretty heinous examples of of management. <laughs> so, how would you describe your style as a manager, Phil? Well, I, I guess there's one line in there I don't even remember. We've been through eight drafts, but uh, the guy on the NPR says, "Well, you're really a lousy manager," and he said, uh, "He said you didn't answer letters, and you sent people all over the country," and uh, he said. Uh, and it's even mentioned in the book. And I said, well, I may have mentioned it, but I didn't want anybody to believe it. Uh, so that, uh, I don't know. I mean, basically, it's uh, it's a little bit uh, unique style, I suppose. That, uh, But uh, generally, it's, uh, I went to the uh, Sparky Anderson School of Management, the old manager of Cincinnati Reds, and I asked him, uh, you know, uh, you're not treating all the people the same. And he says, of course I'm not treating all the people the same. If Johnny Bench asked for a day off at spring training. He's going to get it. If the rookie asked for a day off at spring training, I said, get your ass out on the field. <laughs> so there are a lot of people, including uh, the two I'm talking to, that you give a lot of room to. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, we're coming well, back. I mean, I'm totally coming back. I'm going to start tomorrow. <laughs> Although I don't even recognize the place now. I was there last year. I got lost. Uh, yeah, but... no, I have a little trouble recognizing it, too. But I, I just want to touch on one thing, because you grasp it uh, easier than other people. Other people say, Wasn't, well, how, why did you stay with it? Wasn't that just horrible, all that tension and everything? They don't understand. It's the most fun I ever had. Yeah. <sighs> Well, yeah, well, that every day you came to work. Every day, everybody came to work. You were so full of adrenaline because this day mattered. Mm-hmm. And Lee, and you felt that way in your work, right? Well, you, when you're describing the meetings, which you call in the book, unbelievably, the management meetings, which would now be called off sites, um, your people mm-hmm. refer to as butt faces. Okay, right, that's <laughs> which right. is very immature, but very funny in it the is. book. 
<laughs> and you say that those were the most fun you'd ever had. Like, and that's the way I felt about our staff meetings there. I laughed harder yeah. and I had more fun than I did in any job ever at Nike. Why yeah. do you, why is a sense of humor so important in business? Cause some, well, I do think it, it is important because, uh, because there's so much tension and there's so much on the line, you know, two or three times a week. And, uh, to cut the tension with some laughter just helps everybody, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in the case of the butt faces, it sounds like that included just a lot of mocking, a lot of put downs, a, lo- right. a lot of conflict. And I think Leon and I both grew up with older brothers. So we totally got that part of it. No, that's right. You guys get right in. Right in. <laughs> I'm wondering, did you ever get a memo from HR like, Mr. Knight, please stop calling the offsites butt faces now? Like, you're a, you're a publicly traded well, company. Please don't do that. We don't call them that anymore. I think we figured that out ourselves. Okay. <laughs> you know, with, <laughs> what? You have something else? Sorry, go ahead, Leanne. One of the no, things that really comes through in the book, and if you were an employee of Nike, you got it. There were sort of two kinds of people there. There were the runners, and then there were the rest of us. And by runners, I mean serious competitive athletes like yourself right. and that were employees now, but like just everybody ran at Nike, but some people were runners. And it's so essential to sort of your personal identity, and it comes through in the book that that was really an essential business practice for you. What is it about running? If you had been a tennis player, would it have been the same company? Uh, you know, probably not. Uh, that uh, I don't know. But uh, I've been I've had questions around that. And uh, first of all, I think uh, running is important for health, and I think it's important to break tension. It's uh, you know to go for a six mile run at the end of a tough day, you know, uh, helps. And uh, but the other thing is there's uh, there is a sort of a uh, characteristic of runners that uh, you know uh, characterized a little bit by the loneliness of the long distance runner. I mean, you start in the fall and when you're a college runner and you start in the fall, you know, running whatever it is, 70 miles a week, knowing that you're not, your big race is not until March. And uh, so I think there's some of that uh, that helped uh, in looking at the long, long view where we were with Nike and, and what it was trying to become. The other essential piece of that is Oregon. Those are the two things that, yep. you know, yep. really define you. And for people not lucky enough to have lived in Oregon or be from there, what is it about Oregon that made it so essential to Nike and Nike essential to Oregon? You can, you can explain that as well as anybody, mm-hmm. probably better. But uh, obviously, if we'd have been uh, birthed in Texas or New York or Florida or the Midwest, the culture would have been different. And uh, that uh, I think for us, uh, kind of the Oregon uh, – the being based in Oregon basically did help. There's the, I remember uh, when P.J. Colissimo from Seton Hall in New Jersey got the head coaching job with the Portland Trailblazers. The first day he came, he got a ticket, a speeding ticket. He walked in the Trailblazer office and says, who do you give this to to fix? And uh, they looked at him like he was crazy. I mean, that, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that sort of explained the difference between New Jersey and Oregon right there, I think. But, <laughs> that, uh, or Oregon, you know, that basically uh, it sort of follows the rules and uh, it, it lends itself to working together, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's been good for us. But there's also that total pioneer spirit in Oregon yep. that I always felt like we grew up on the East Coast. And when I moved west, moved to Portland to come work for you at Nike, that is what I loved the most is the sort of anything goes. There are no rules. We didn't grow up in some sort of, you know, rule bound society where we all went to the same schools. Well, right. you actually did all go to the same schools because you all went to the <laughs> University of Oregon. <laughs> I remember saying to people, well, at Nike, it's pretty much you either went to the U of O or you didn't. And if you did, they really have no idea. Yeah, they couldn't care less where you went to school. And I actually loved that part of it. Yeah, no, I think you've touched on a lot of things that are absolutely right. Uh, one thing that comes up again and again in the book that just it makes me laugh to say it out loud. So I'm going to say it out loud. Every once in a while, your father would just tell you to stop jackassing around with those shoes. That's right. <laughs> No, that was a, an expression that he used, particularly with what I was doing. <laughs> and yet, you stuck with that, you know, and you talked to him on the phone every night, which is right. not something I knew about you until I read the book. It was, and actually, I got to tell you, I, I was surprised. Yeah. 
No, uh, no, no. Yeah, he would he would call every night uh, to check in on his grandkids, and and actually grew to have an interest in the business. And uh, so he lived long enough to uh, see us go public, and for about three or four years after that. So basically, by then it wasn't jackassing around anymore, and it was okay. So we had very pleasant conversations in the evening. That's so great. You know, obviously the the darkest chapter of your life is when uh, your son Matt died in a diving accident, and you write about it very movingly in the book. Um, it does it does it make it any easier to talk about now that you've written about it? Does that help in any way? Not really. I mean, it's been what uh, twelve years now, and uh, that uh, I've, I've, I can function just fine now. I can laugh at a joke, but the hole in your heart never goes away. So it's uh, it's always there. And uh, I knew that uh, if I was going to write a memoir, I couldn't duck the issue. So uh, I got it out there. And then having gotten out there in the book, that uh, I can't really not have it asked as a question. So I get that. And uh, so I, I can talk about it, but I, I wouldn't say it helped or hurt. Mm-hmm. There's such an outpouring of love from the community after Matt's death. Matt's death. You yeah. write about that, that you heard from everyone, employees, yep. athletes, everyone. Do you think that well, changed having worked you? at Nike, I, I'm sure you can imagine it. When when people uh, get knocked down here, the, the the fellow teammates really rally around them, and that's been consistent from almost day one. Yeah. Did that change you? Do you think just seeing that? Did that surprise you? It was heartwarming. Uh, I don't know that I was surprised, but uh, I, I just wasn't thinking anything. And then this, all these emails and and postal mails and cards came pouring in and phone calls. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think that's why you decided to write the book? I mean, the book you actually wrote, which is not usual for um, a failed encyclopedia salesman to go out <laughs> and write a book. I'm sorry. I can't. I just kept saying to Liz, how is it possible that he sold encyclopedias in Hawaii? So. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're like famously, painfully shy. <laughs> and as Leon said, like the palest guy we ever met. So yeah. Hawaii going door to door just does not seem like you're calling. But then you well, found it. it. Yeah, and I, you read I, I did it, it for a week. I didn't make a single sale, and I got bit by one dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you may have a future as a writer. Are you going to do more writing? I mean, it's really beautifully written, and you know, very clear. There's a lot of complicated well, stuff. Well, I don't know that. Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing planned. Okay. <laughs> No, Come on, you're stepping down as chairman this summer, right? You're stepping down as chairman. Doesn't that mean we're going to get a sequel? It definitely does not. I definitely didn't have one in mind at all when I wrote this. That was just the kind of the years that I wanted people to know about. Uh, I got asked that a lot. I, I'm not thinking that way now at all, but I wouldn't rule it out. Okay. All right, because Liz wasn't mentioned, so that's all. I mean, just saying, maybe. <laughs> no, no, we were actually, Phil, we were laughing about the fact that, really, the most famous athlete that you write about in this book, people will be shocked to know, is Ely Nastasi gets a lot of big <laughs> in your book. <laughs> Given he was our people... first one. <laughs> yes, and Steve Prefontaine, I guess. That would be, yeah. those would yeah. be the two that got a lot yeah. of your attention. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you tell people that they should, seek their calling. I mean, somehow your coach, Bill Bowerman, uh, the, that partnership, that obviously cemented for you a calling. But I know you you give that advice to people. Like, how do they find that? How do they, do you have any insight into how somebody actually decides this is a true calling? Well, I think uh, it's a, it, you kind of know it when you find it. And I think uh, the idea that you try to find it before you're 20 years old is a mistake a lot of people make. That I think those years between, like, you know, people go to four years to college, you know, and they think they want well, this is what I'm going to major on and this is what I'm going to be. And uh, I think that's a bad approach to it. I think that uh, you go to, to college to get a basic background, but you really search the calling between the ages of 19 and 30. And I wouldn't be in a hurry to find it. I would hope to find it by them 30, but not. Uh, you don't really need to find it before. And then just yeah. try. Try like hard. Try like hell. Yeah. Well, you always said you only have to succeed the last time. That's I right. That was an expression the old entrepreneurship teacher taught. <laughs> and I remember you also saying, you know, I thought we could fail. Sometimes I even thought we should fail, but I never thought we would fail. That's absolutely true statement. And, uh, again, that's, uh, that surprises people because we were so close to failing, but I, I really never thought we would. 
Well, the um, thank you for so much for talking to us. This, this means a lot to us. As you write in the book, it's never just business. Uh, yeah. And, and we know you believe that, and we believe that too. That's why it's such a, a pleasure to be able to share this moment with you with the success of Shoe Dog and, and talk a little bit about those days when we all work together. So I guess we're coming back. I think you, I think you sealed the deal here today, Phil. <laughs> we're back. The Dolans are back. <laughs> I'll, I'll let HR, you'll love our HR department now. Oh, there's an HR department? That's yeah, amazing. first time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, we are the Satellite Sisters. This has been Phil Knight. Uh, he's the author of a new memoir, uh, Shoe Dog, which is such a term of endearment. I smiled even when I saw the title of your book. So congratulations, Phil. It was great reconnecting. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Bye. <laughs> this is Leanne. This is Liz. We're back. Well, Liz, he has not changed one bit. Has he? <laughs> that guy never changes. It's funny for a guy who says business is change that he is like totally 100% the same guy. <laughs> I mean, my gosh, it would still be difficult to be his PR person, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> He's got heart and soul, though. So right. that's, you know, that's what I always loved about him. That's why I loved working for him. And that's why, like, even since this book has come out, Shoe Dog, I've heard from so many fellow alums, as you say, because people just, you know, it's a special experience. Uh to work there, especially in some of the early days. So so that was a lot of fun. But he's clearly not enjoying the publicity side. I'll tell you, one thing I didn't expect was a job offer. So I may take him oh, up yeah. on that. You, you really, you're considering that? Okay. <laughs> Maybe time to go back. Go back to Beaverton. Well, back to Beaverton. With, but, uh, yeah, back as he, to Beaverton. As he says, now that he has an HR department, he, they, they might actually be able to make you a job offer. The, my actual, okay, my actual job interview with Phil Knight, like, at the end of the interview, he said, uh, he said, okay, well, we're actually going to, we're obviously going to offer you this job, so who's supposed to do that? <laughs> that was in my job interview. Uh, and I said, I said, well, it's your company, so you can offer me the job <laughs> if you want. But I've been dealing with this other guy, and, if, and I'm going to call him in the morning. So you could talk to him tonight, and I'll call Howard in the morning, and Howard can offer me the job. He said, okay, that's great. Let's do that. <laughs> and that's how our business relationship was born. <laughs> that is a funny story. That is like every story in Shoe Dog. Every story in Shoe Dog was like, hey, you're hired to be the apparel designer. Well, you're a terrible apparel designer. Who hired you? I did? Okay, never mind. You can't design the apparel anymore. <laughs> so, well, you Liz, know, I, you mentioned those Nike principles. Can you yeah. post those on yes. our website? Because it is literally like a type, you know, written on a typewriter, like numbered one through 10. Mm -hmm. The syntax doesn't match. It's weird. just very weird. Like it needed an editor, but whatever. Yeah. It all fit on one page, which is important. Okay. Oh, and I did want to mention one more that I didn't get to in our interview with Phil. Number six is live off the land. And you what know, does that mean? What does that mean? This was a scrappy young company, and you just had to kind of scramble to get the resources you need. And so my experience of live off the land, and, you know, when I joined in 88, uh, my first day of work, like I showed up. And I'm like, okay, here I am. And they're like, oh, oh yeah, hi. Okay, let's see, where are we going to put you? They're like, come here. And we were in, this is way before the world headquarters was built. So we were in a warehouse in Beaverton, Oregon called Nimbus. And there, <laughs> do you remember Nimbus? I, I do. I, I was in the, a warehouse in downtown um, Portland, which was on the second floor of a novelty company. So down below us, they made whoopee cushions. And up above, <laughs> up above is where we worked. Yeah. And in the book, he talks a lot about starting the company in the room above the pink bucket. They were like above a bar. And when the jukebox came on every afternoon, they had to kind of knock off. 
<laughs> so anyway, so anyway, so I show up for work, live off the land. And so, but there's Nimbus one, two, three, four. So I like, I, I go into Nimbus one and they're like, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have a space for you. Follow me. And I'm following this woman through Nimbus one and then Nimbus two, Nimbus two, get into Nimbus four, which is a giant warehouse, uh, which is loads of shoe designers and piles and piles of shoes everywhere. And, uh, and she brought me to a space and it's all cement floors. And she sort of gestured at a opening on the floor. And she said, here's, here's where you'll be. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. So I just like go like scare up my own desk and chair. She's like, yeah, you'll probably find one around here. Yeah. And she just didn't just put yourself right here. <laughs> this was my, that was my entire orientation. And you were the director of PR. Yeah. It's not like. Yeah. It wasn't, but it was just like, if you couldn't pass that test, you should not work there. <laughs> You know, it was like this very basic, almost Darwinian thing. Like, if that freaked you out, oh, my God, what you were about to face was <laughs> you were not going to be able to, to cut it. Uh, so, um, so yeah, live off the land. I think, I think that's what he meant there. Number nine was it won't be pretty. And I think we can. <laughs> <laughs> but it will anyway. be fun. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. That's for sure. That's and there was sure. a very unusual, the sense of camaraderie was really amazing, you know? And uh, so, you know, and he said that in the conversation we just had with him, that it was intense. And so anyone who's been in an intense business situation knows you also have intense personal connections. And uh, uh, that's, that's the way it was. I, I remember one time somebody asking him, like, there were a lot of people at Nike that were, like, married to each other or used to be married to each right. other or, you know, fathers and daughters and mothers and sons. And But on the, the sort of married, formerly married, whatever, somebody asked him once about that, like, how did he feel about that? He's like, I think it's great that everyone gets along so well. <laughs> 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 and I'm sure now a modern day HR department would have some kind of policy about that. <laughs> well, but the, uh, the other thing that, you know, he touched on it with the t intensity, um, and the running, but it was a very competitive company, not yeah. within the company, but against other companies, mm -hmm. like the other shoe companies were the enemy. Mm -hmm. Like there was no doubt there, there was mm -hmm. no, and if you mm -hmm. left to go to another shoe company, that was not good. <laughs> you were dead to him. You were. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That, there was no doubt about that. That mm -hmm. like, and I mean, I haven't worked at, at Nike in 23 years and uh, I cannot buy another brand of shoes. I, can, <laughs> I cannot do it. I, I have not. I just can't do it. I can't do it. There's a loyalty there. He's a very loyal guy. And yeah. there's a loyalty factor there. That was very important. Right. And I'm afraid that I would get seen you know like the one time in my life i ever wore another brand i would bump into him on the street or something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which i think the chances are very slim given his lifestyle and my lifestyle but i'm, I'm still too afraid of that <laughs> getting busted for lack of loyalty anyway that that was a pleasure so the the nike principles will be posted at satellitesisters.com um Believe me, there are whole Harvard Business School and Stanford Business School uh, studies done on this. But this is one typewritten page, people. Everything you want to know about how to start a corporate culture. Right there. You know, I should remind you, if you're new to Satellite Sisters, just joining us for this Phil Knight interview, we've been on the air for 15 years. Uh, we have a lot of um, archived interviews, including interviews with business leaders and world leaders like Bill Clinton, J.J. Abrams, Melody Hobson, Commander Eileen Collins, Nora Ephron, uh, and those will all be posted at iTunes. You can just search Satellite Sisters at iTunes or go to our website, SatelliteSisters.com. But there's lots of listening and lots of business discussions here on Satellite Sisters every week. Great. So I just want to wrap up today's show, Leanne, with the winners of our Satellite Sisters Celebrations contest. Mm. You know, we're having a photo contest going on the Satellite Sisters Facebook group and on Instagram uh, to, we want to see your pictures of your celebrations with your Satellite Sisters. So during the month of April, May, and June, at the end of every month, we're pulling winners. You post your photos, you tag them, hashtag SatSistersYTB, 
Sad Sisters, you're the best. And uh, so I have the the April winners on Instagram. Jane Cancun, you are the winner. You posted a, and this is a random drawing. Your photo was the color run in Concord, New Hampshire with my fun friends. So that's sort of kismet, Leon. that after talking to Phil. Sure. Uh, a runner is the winner. And from the Facebook group, our winner is Anne Friendrice Martell. And this was a really fun photo of Pennsylvania mothers of multiples having a state convention. And so it's all these mothers of, you know, multiples. And But it's a Mardi Gras theme land. And you know how we love Mardi Gras. So Anne and Jane, you are the winners of the Satellite Sister Celebration Contest for April. So if you email us, info at SatelliteSisters.com, send us your information, where you should send your prize, which is a copy of our book, uh, Satellite Sisters, You're the Best. All right. We are the Satellite Sisters. If you want any more information about us or to find those Nike principles that Liz is promising, you're, want to go, you're going to want to go to SatelliteSisters.com. Happy Mother's Day to all. We are thinking of you. If you're a mother, an aunt, a sister, a teacher, a mentor, a grandmother, someone who steps in and, and uh, cares for a child, happy Mother's Day to you. Liz, have a fantastic weekend. Thanks. And happy Mother's Day again to you. Liam. Thank you. And don't forget, call your Satellite Sister. Thank you.